Well, it's good to have everybody with us again tonight. This is the second session of the awakening and the activation teaching. Last week we had a very good, very good session. Uh, we had some healings take place last week and, and God was very gracious with us. But today we're going to continue picking up right where we left, left off last week. And we're just going to continue with the, the themes that God brings about tonight. And um, I just want to encourage you to really be open to the Holy Spirit tonight. Allow Him to minister to you. Allow Him to um, enlighten you in what is your purpose in the kingdom, what is your purpose in the church. What we're trying to do is empower the church. We're, we're trying to raise up the church to... Um, get them to actually do the work of the ministry. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, 12, and 13, you can see that Jesus gives gifts to the church. These are gifts that Jesus gave to the church. Matter of fact, why don't we just turn there tonight? We'll just start off with this. Ephesians, this is not a slide, this is not part of the, this is just something that just come to mind. Ephesians chapter 4. Hopefully you have your Bible the kind that has paper because you can't really highlight too well on the electronic versions. So it's kind of nice to have paper. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 11. All this is talking about Jesus prior to this. And so when it talks in verse 11 that he gave gifts, it's talking about Jesus. Jesus has given gifts. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as the evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. It's five ministry gifts right there. What's the purpose? Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. To a mature man, to the measure of the statue which belongs to the fullness of Christ. All right, now, now look at that. These five ministry gifts are given to the church by Jesus to equip us to bring us into a maturity into the fullness of Jesus Christ. Therefore, when we are together as an assembly of believers, we need to have an exposure to all five of those ministry gifts. These are different functions. I'm not going to say positions because people look after positions. They want positions. And I'm talking about positions, I'm talking about functions. When the, 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 when the calling is there, there's the function that is gifted to the man by Jesus so that he can actually do the work within the ministry of the church and prepare people to do the work of the ministry. Verse 13, or verse 14. As a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the craftiness and de deceitful scheming. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects. Look at that, in all aspects. We're to grow up. We're not supposed to be children after having 40 years in the Lord. We're not supposed to be babies. We're supposed to be mature people in the Lord so that we can do the work of the ministry. I think I skipped over verse 12. Let's go back to verse 12. So give the emphasis. Why are the five given? For the equipping of the saints. For the equipping of the saints. Do I have any saints here tonight? Amen. If you're a believer, you're a saint. 
So the fivefold minister gifts are given to equip the saints for the work of the of service to the building up of the body of Christ, the body of Christ. Right? These these five minister gifts are given to the body of Christ, not to one local assembly, but to the body. And that's what we're we're endeavoring to do here in this in this teaching of uh, awakening and and. Uh, Activation. Thanks, Veda. <laughs> We're trying to activate you. We're trying to get you to grow up and become part of what God is doing today. Okay? So last week we had a, we had a really good teaching. We had a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of themes that were coming out. I'm not going to take the time to, to go over those again. I would encourage you to either get on Facebook and look for the video that we posted live. We had, last time that I looked, we had 265 viewings on that video. So that's exciting. That's really exciting because people all over the world, we have people from Burma that was looking at that video. Mm -hmm. And so that's great. You know, we're, we're, touching, we're touching the world just right here in this, in this uh, room the words going out to Mexico, to everywhere that we have an influence, and so I encourage you to, to either find it on Facebook or you can go to YouTube and look for my name, Galen Scott, and you can find that teaching along with several other teachings uh, for your benefit. But tonight we're going to continue. We, we left off last week talking about the believer, and we, we were talking about just because you come to church, just because you sit in a pew, just because you listen to a sermon, just because you applaud, just because you talk the, the lingo like the Christians talk, doesn't make you a believer. You know, sometimes we get confused because we think that if, if somebody comes to church, they're a believer, but that's not always the case. There's a lot more to a believer than that issue. And then we looked at the, the fact that uh, Jesus recognized people that were his disciples. They were disciples. They said that they were disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of them. But in John chapter 6, when he said, You must drink my blood and eat of my flesh. Those disciples, those many disciples... They said, hey, this is a tough teaching. Who can bear with this teaching? Who can support this? And so those disciples really turned out not to be believers. And it says in verse 66 of chapter 6 that many did not walk with him no more. The majority of the disciples were no longer his followers. And they left him. And he turned to the twelve. And he said, And you, you guys, you want to leave too? And Peter turned and he said, Where would we go? If we left you, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. So they recognized that Jesus was the Son of God, and that He had the words of eternal life. And so therefore, when they said that they believed, they also accepted Him as the Son of God. Now just that, just that, the Son of God, the Messiah, the one that was sent by God to bring Israel back into the kingdom. Waiting so many years, the prophecies of the, of the Old Testament, the prophecies of the prophets. Announcing the Messiah coming. And they knew, because of what they've seen and what they experienced. Peter says, you are the Son of God. Where will we go? It's you that has the, the words. And that's where you've got to come to in this, this teaching. In, in, in what... We are going to be experimenting. You've got to come to a place where you know 
you know that Jesus is the Son of God. Not just a theory, not just a, a mental ascension, but you've got to come to a place where you say, I know that you are the Son of God. I know that you are the risen Christ. The risen Christ. Not the dead Christ in a tomb, but the risen Christ that is alive today. And he's wanting to show himself as the res risen Christ today by his power, by the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit. So talking about all that, we're going to continue on with the, with the, with the scriptures tonight. I want you... If we could put up scripture 15, please. Jesus himself qualifies. He qualifies the identity of the believer. What he does, he shows us exactly who he considers the believer. And we have to look at what he says, right? He's the son of God. His words are the eternal words. So Jesus qualifies the identity of the believer using words like those who believe in me, okay, or other words like he who has believed. Those are two things that we're going to be looking at that Jesus is saying to identify them as believers. In these two references, we will find the litmus test you understand what I mean by the litmus test? That means we will prove, we will prove what Jesus says is a believer. And you're going to find out why I'm stressing this so much in what is this activation time? What is this awakening time? Because the believer, the believer, not just the ones that attend, but the believer has specific inheritance that they can tap into. It's the believer that, that comes into the, into the position of being a child of God and that has access to what we looked at last week. What was that scripture? There's a scripture we looked at and it's very important. It's found in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. If you go back to that, let's, let's go back to that real quick. If somebody could look that up real quick and I'll, I'll let you read it. Okay, I'll just read it. I, I see it here. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, not that He will have, or not in the future, it's not that you're going to get it when you get into your glorified body, not when Jesus comes back, but He's already given it. This is past tense. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ so when we talk about these heavenly blessings we realize that there is nothing that God has kept back in reserve nothing there's not a blessing that exists in heaven that has not been already given to us amen is that what that verse says right Every okay, so if we have received every spiritual blessing, but where is it at? It's in the heavenly places, in, in Christ. Heavenly places. We're going to talk about that tonight. In heavenly places. And then we also looked at, now, okay, let's, let's, let's reconsider this. One, we have every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing. Do you lack on the spiritual blessing side? No. I mean, every spiritual blessing every spiritual blessing nothing held back from you everything is given to you also in john chapter 3 i believe it's like 34 john the baptist is talking about jesus and he says for he whom god has sent speaks the words of god and he says and he gives the spirit without measure the Holy Spirit we see, saw last week that it is Jesus that is the baptizer of the Holy Spirit and so when he baptizes us with the Holy Spirit how much do you receive 
You receive all of it without measure. A fullness. There's not half measure, not a quarter measure. There's not a Holy Spirit Junior for the children. I mean, we are talking about a full measure of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about an unlimited blessing of the Father held in spiritual places, in heavenly places. So there is nothing that the believer lacks. He has the power of the Holy Spirit. He has the blessings of the Father. What does he lack? He lacks many times the knowledge of who he is in Christ Jesus. That's the biggest issue that we, we deal with today is trying to get people to discover who they are in Christ Jesus. What are the, the inherited blessings that God has provided to us? What is the power that flows through our, our being when we are baptized and full of the Holy Spirit? We limit ourselves many, many, many times. Well, I can say we limit ourselves, period. And we're going to get into some scriptures tonight that's going to really challenge you. It's going to, it challenges me all the time. I keep these scriptures fresh in my mind because I know that I haven't arrived. I haven't arrived to the place where God wants me. Even though I have made great gain, I still have not arrived. There's so much more that I want to experience in God. And I've got to do the same thing as all of this has to do in this room. I have to do a battle in myself, a battle to renew my mind, a battle to step out in faith, a battle to lay hold of my inheritance and let God be God of my life. Okay. He's got an expectation of the true believer. In Mark chapter 16, again, I've got to qualify this. This is a disclaimer. This is not my opinion. Okay, so if you're going to get mad, don't get mad at me. Okay, these are the words of Jesus. Now, last time I, I, I checked, if we're Christians, we follow the Christ, right? We follow Jesus. So therefore, what he speaks, he's got the words of life. We should hear and allow him to dictate to us what he finds relevant, what he finds important, and listen with spiritual ears so that we can hear what he's trying to say. In Mark 16, 16, he says, He who has believed, has been baptized, shall be saved. But he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Verse 17. These signs will accompany those who have believed. All right. Now, guys, let's get let's get this right. Look at that verse and look at it very closely. I want I want you to see it for what it is. Jesus is not making any options here. There's not an option B. There's not option C. There is only one reality that he uses to define what is in his consideration is a true believer. A true believer has five different attributes, has five different things that are manifesting in his life according to Jesus. And when he says these signs will accompany, okay, you understand that? These signs will accompany. I mean, if you're a believer, if you're a believer, these signs will be following you and your ministry. Number one, in my name, they will cast out demons. They will cast out demons. In our churches today, <laughs> in our churches today, if there was a demon manifestation in, in our local assemblies, I would have to say that 99% of the people or 95% of the people would have no idea of what to do. They would not know how to cast the demon out. They would be surprised. Many of them would run from the building. So a lot of people go to our church. Does that mean that there's no demons? No, there's demons. 
but they're not threatened. They get threatened and they will start to manifest. They start to be discovered, there will be a manifestation. So as we start to talk about activation, awakening, activation, listen people, be prepared. Be prepared to see things that you've never seen before. Be prepared for, for the battle. There is a spiritual battle that happens. And you must be prepared for that. But as a believer, as a believer, no options. You will cast out demons. Period. Not optional. Not optional. Just not optional. Number two. Number two, if according to Jesus, now this is not my words, this is Jesus' words. According to Jesus, the believer, they will speak with new tongues. Not optional, according to Jesus. He said, listen, if you believe you're going to cast out demons too. You're going to speak in new tongues. You're going to speak in tongues. I used to think that was optional. I used to think that you could you could please God and, and be a fulfilled Christian without speaking in tongues, without having the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I have come to the position, I have come to the reality that Jesus says, uh, every believer, every believer, not optional, needs to be speaking in tongues. It's just one of those things that, that says he is a believer. He is a believer. Number three, they'll pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. Well, this is one of those items that we're not going to put God to the test. But if it happens, if we drink something that is deadly, we have to have the same faith as if to cast out a demon. The same faith that it takes to speak in tongues. We have to have the same faith to overcome that deadly poison. Paul did it in the book of Acts. He was shipwrecked on an island, cold. He went and picked up a, a pile of, of wood to take it to the fire. And in that pile of wood was a, a venomous snake that laid hold of his hand. It bit him on the hand. And the people of the island were watching him to check when he was going to fall over dead. But he didn't fall over dead. He went over to the fire and he shook the serpent off into the, into the fire. And they all was watching, when is he going to die? He must have been an unrighteous man for this to happen to him. Something bad he's done and now he's, he's suffering the judgment. But when judgment didn't come, when nothing happened to him, he was a witness to the entire village. There was something that happened in that entire island, and I believe it started with that, that very miracle Amen. of that snake mm -hmm. not affecting Paul's life. Amen. Amen. Number four. Now, I've separated this out. Number four. They will lay hands on the sick. Every believer. Every believer. Not just the pastors, not just the evangelists, not just the apostles, not just the prophets. Every single believer, every single believer lays their hands on the sick. Okay, that is why we are here in this time of activation. Because we want every single believer to be in what is the work of the ministry. Laying your hands on the sick. It's one thing to lay your hands on the sick. But then the other part of it, number five, and they will recover. Okay? So, listen. Do you see that there's an expectation that Jesus has upon the church? Do you see that? He wants us to be casting out demons. He wants us to be speaking in tongues. He wants us. To be laying our hands on the sick and he wants us to heal somebody asked me the other day what if what if it's not God's will for somebody to be healed let me tell you something it is God's will that every single person is healed 
Sickness is not of, of, the, of God. It is part of a fallen world. It is part of this fallen environment in which we live in. God, when He thinks about us, when He thinks about us, it says in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, He says, And thus saith the Lord, I have plans for you. Why don't we read that? Verse 20, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. We saw this last night in, in, the, in the Bible study, but it's a good verse. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Do you have it? Can you read it? Oh, no, I don't have it. Okay. Tell me you find it. Jeremiah? Andrea. Andrea has it. Come on. 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 Come for I am with you and will save you, says the Lord. I will completely destroy the nations where I have scattered you, but I will not completely destroy you. 29, 11? Yeah. Okay. I'm okay. Sorry. No, it was good. That was good, but it wasn't okay. quite the verse I wanted. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans, they are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, what, what what do you do with that verse? I know the plans I have for you. My mind is to give you a future and a hope. They're good. Mm -hmm. They're not bad. Well, They're not for your destruction. Mm -hmm. God's plan is that you have a future and a hope. That's what God wants for every single person. But every single person has got to come into that. We cannot accept illness as being from God. In my name, it says in that last verse, in verse 16 or 18, in my name they will cast out demons. This is, we're going back to Mark 16, verse 16 and 18. In my name they will cast out demons. In my name they will speak in new tongues. In my name they will pick up serpents. In my name they will lay hands on the sick. In my name they will recover. In my name. And when I was typing this up, a verse came to my mind. It's found in Matthew chapter 7. This is very important because now we're starting to get to our responsibility. Jesus has got an expectation, but we have a responsibility. Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23. Verse 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now underline this next part. But he who does the will of my Father who is heaven, in heaven. who is in heaven, will enter. Last week I told you, I like to get into a scripture and I like to pull it apart. I like to know exactly what the scripture is trying to say. So this scripture, when we look at it, many people in that day will be saying, well, hey, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we do that in your name? And Jesus is saying, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to get into heaven. Not everyone is going to do that. But only the ones that do the will of my Father. There's a key right there. The will of the Father. That is going to be a focus of a lot of what we're going to be talking about, about entering into the kingdom. Because according to God, there is no other will. In His kingdom, there is only one will. And we have to come into that will in order to reproduce that will. And those that do that will have an entrance into the kingdom. If you're not doing that, then I would say that you do not have an entrance into the kingdom. Verse 22. And many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Didn't we do, hey, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? In 
your name did we not cast out demons? In your name. And in your name perform many miracles? In your name. Now why am I saying that? Because there is power. Listen to me. There is power in the name of Jesus. Demons will be cast out using the name of Jesus. Miracles will happen using the name of Jesus. Prophecy can happen in the name of Jesus.